your chairman, Ed Nano. All right, thanks, Mark. I appreciate the uh, introduction. Uh, let me see. I'm going to uh, start recording this now. Just for everybody's uh, everybody's well-being, we are recording this, and it will be placed up on our website afterwards uh, for for those uh, for those of us who could not um, could not join us tonight. And so, all right, it is recording now. All right, so. Let me see, do I see myself? Okay. All right, so uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you, the Committee of the Wimbledon Philosophical so Society for inviting me to make this presentation on uh, the subject of Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, Les Mouches and the concept of freedom. Um, I've actually gotten quite a few um, bits of information from some of you on this call uh, to do some further research in preparation for this, uh, specifically Eric Fromm's The Fear of Freedom and uh, Tragedy in France by uh, Andre Moreau. Uh, so I have uh, <clears throat> been given, uh, as, as Mark has said, I've been given some insight into the fact that this play is widely read um, in, in high school and colleges uh, here in, in uh, both England and on the continent. Um, before we start, I wanna say that uh, there is a, uh, an event coming up. Um, Ann, Ann Williams has uh, sent me uh, some information. The committee has met about uh, a garden party on the 25th of July that will be hosted by Val and Chris Morrison. Uh, from 1 to 3.30 p.m. Um, over on Marriott Road, which is where they live. Uh, the uh, details will be sent along um, as they become available. It's going to be a uh, bring your own picnic uh, type of event and the uh, society will supply the drinks for the, for the meeting. So uh, the format will be um, people reading um, different forms of poetry, um, Anne will be reading Keats because it's his birthday, uh, anniversary of his death, sorry. And uh, Eva will be introducing some haiku and uh, reading a selection of poems of, of her own and uh, some other ones uh, that she's bringing along. And again, the full program has not been decided on, but um, there will be uh, an announcement coming out later on. But if you can uh, mark your calendar for that, the, the 25th of July, that's going to be the next upcoming and it will be in person. So thankfully uh, not Zoom again, because uh, it'd be nice to actually meet everybody in person. So what I wanna do here is uh, I'm gonna give a short talk uh, followed by a question and answer. And then hopefully we have a subsequent discussion um, after this um, uh, about anything in, that's gonna generate interest in the, in the, in the conversation. Um, how many of you have actually read this play either at school, university, for pleasure, or in preparation for this meeting? Let's see. Okay, so we have quite actually good. So that's great. Okay, so we have uh, almost three quarters of the people are familiar with this play. I have to admit that I had never heard of it until um, until someone recommended that we talk about it. So it's been an interesting uh, researching it. I did know about Sartre obviously, but not, uh, not this play specifically. Um, so an overview of the talk, where am I sitting? Okay, so an overview of the talk structurally, what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give a short background um, and biography of Sartre, talk about some of his written output, um, specifically uh, this play we're going to go into detail about and uh, also talk about his, uh, some of his other work, where he considers the flies to fall within sort of the canon of his writings. And then I want to talk a little bit, uh, drill down a little bit into the notion of incorporating German, German interpretations of philosophy into French thinking, which were uh, really paved the way um, through Sartre's thought. And then I'm, I'm going to do a short synopsis of the book in three acts. Um, 
reading some of the lines. So you have to bear with me for that because I'm not actually a, a theatrical actor, but uh, it, it's kind of hard to get around actually reading the content um, to understand what's going on. So, uh, examine two themes that recur in the novel and then we'll wrap it up with some final observations. I'm gonna be using a lot of Sartre's own words, um, specifically in the play, to get the true feeling of the existential dilemma that he's, he's describing throughout the play. And therefore I do use some lengthy dialogue, so please bear, bear with me. I have a couple of props here that should help me along the way uh, to compensate for my lack of theatrical talent. All right. Um, so to understand, you know, a play or anything, it's necessary to take a little bit uh, of look into the biography and the background of, of the author. So we start out with um, Sartre was born uh, on June 21st, 1905 in Paris, France. He was the an only child uh, of uh, Jean Baptiste and Anne Marie Sartre. His father was a naval officer who died of a fever when Sartre was only 17 months old. So he didn't know his father. He was very young. As a student, he began uh, attending the, the Ecole Normale Supérieure. Now, uh, I'm going to slaughter some French words, unfortunately, but so please bear with me there. And he earned a doctorate in philosophy in 1929. It was there he met uh, Simone de Beauvoir, his lifetime partner, who was arguably as famous as he was. Um, Following his graduation, he was drafted into the French army where he served uneventfully from uh, 1929 to 1931, then returned to Paris. And uh, he was unfortunately drafted again to fight in the French army during World War II um, and spent nine months um, actually as a prisoner of war. When he returned from World War II in uh, 1941, he and de Beauvoir determined to become more involved in public life during the German occupation of France. So that's sort of the setting for uh, what is gonna, going to go on in the intellectual life of, of, of Sartre. Um, <clears throat> one thing of note uh, that I came across uh, is that, that Sartre was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize in 1964 and he famously declined it. Um, he was awarded it for, quote, uh, his work, which rich in ideas and filled with the spirit of freedom and the quest for truth has exerted a far reaching influence on our age, unquote. That was uh, the, what the committee awarded it to him for. Um, it was still awarded to him despite his refusal. And the reason why he refuses is that he always declined official honors saying that, um, quote, a writer should not allow himself to be turned into an institution. Very interesting comment. Um, so let's turn, uh, before we get into the play, let's turn a little bit into Sartre's philosophy and the, and the part that I actually find the most interesting about his, his life and works. At university, he began reading the works of, of uh, two German philosophers, specifically Edmund Husserl and Martin Heidegger. Um, and these works, these writings heavily influenced his own philosophies. Um, Heidegger wrote Being in Time in 1927. And if you've never read it, um, I don't, I don't uh, hold it against you because it's uh, a monstrosity to get through. Uh, very difficult and uh, it's, it's almost uh, indiscernible unless you have a background uh, in understanding sort, sort of the, the framework. But Heidegger wrote Being in Time in 27, and in it he analyzed the themes of existence and phenomenology, specifically uh, drilling down on the thought of the, the Greek pre-Socratic philosopher Parmenides. And Sartre's own magnum opus was called Being and Nothingness, published in 1943, and it was a play on Heidegger's seminal work, Being in, Being in Time, and being in nothingness. So it was a play actually, direct play on Heidegger's work. And in this book, uh, Being in Nothingness, Sartre is best known for his analysis, existence precedes essence, okay? And what does that mean? Well, in Being in Time, Heidegger does an exposition of Parmenides' concept of thesis, which in Greek is a Greek word, which means unfolding. If you think of uh, as, as uh, the sun comes up and flowers unfold to actually capture the sunlight, 
This is what the concept of thesis means in Greek. And in Heidegger, Heidegger took for, from Parmenides that in reality, nothing ever changes. It's only our sense of, of something that can convey the appearance of change. And this is gonna be central to the thought of what Sartre, of, of Sartre's writing. Now this brings us back to the very beginning of Greek philosophy or in philosophy in general, um, after you got uh, past the uh, pre-Socratics that were worried about was the, was the earth made of water or fire, or these types of things. And we actually got into the, the notions of being. So there's two, two schools of Greek thought. Um, there's one, that humans are born tabula rasa, as we say, or a blank slate, and the other that there's an essence inherent in humans at birth, the concept of, say, original sin, right? These are two opposing um, schools of thought in Greek philosophy, and it is the origin of one of the first classical Greek philosophical arguments. On the one hand, you have Parmenides, who Heidegger and Sartre uh, are both using uh, or siding with, who, can, who he's also considered the founder of, the, of ontology in general, who maintained that nothing ever changes. And the quote from Parmenides here is that thought and being are the same, okay? They're not separated from, from each other. And on the other hand, you have Heraclitus who introduced the notion of flux, the idea that things are constantly changing and that you cannot understand the particulars of anything because the world is constantly changing, okay? Quote from Heraclitus is, everybody's already, everybody here has heard is, you cannot step into the same river twice, right? Because everything is in flux. So in the history of philosophy, Plato sided with Heraclitus, and this was a big move to side with Heraclitus and not with Par Parmenides. And by siding with Heraclitus, Plato, um, Plato asserts that the world of the senses is in flux. The object of these def definitions are not found in imperfect and mutable objects, but exist in super sem sensible realm, which he called the realm of universal forms. And so for Plato, we can never experience justice in itself, but we are always experiencing a conditional form of justice. In following Heraclitus, Plato introduces the idea of the universal form, the perfect instance of what is justice exists not in perceived reality, but only in this super sensible world of the forms. And why is this significant? Okay. Plato in the history of philosophy is, is generally understood as where the beginning of the argumentation um, takes a dialogue form. And it's so significant that Alfred North Whitehead famously said in his book, Process and Reality, that all of Western philosophy is little more than a footnote to Plato, okay? That's how significant Plato has been understood in the history of philosophy. And so why is this distinction, existence precedes essence important? Well, this assertion turns our, cla our Western classical understanding of ontology, that is, philosophy of being on its head. It started with Plato and went all the way through the scholastic tradition. When you get into the early uh, German philosophers and phenomenologies, when you see this um, take a turn. So existence precedes essence. If humans are born with an essence of beings, that, that is uh, humans have some sort of innate trait like selfishness or original sin, then, then they, would, they would be born essentially. However, for Sartre, this is absolutely not true. He says, and I quote, man exists and then defines himself afterwards. Man is condemned to be free, unquote, okay? So we are born into existence and then we create the essence. There is no, there is no predetermined essence to be found in humans. We become who we are by how we choose to react to the world presented to us. People are firstly defined only by their actions, not by the fact that they're selfish or they have original sin. And two, they are only 
they are responsible for those actions. They can only be responsible. God can't be responsible that we were born with original sin. Only through our actions are we responsible. And then there's um, the one line quip famously made by Sartre that we're, we, we probably all know as well. Hell is other people. And I'll leave, I'll leave it to everybody on the call to interpret, interpret what that comment means. Um, by the 1970s, Sartre's health was failing. And um, in, in April of 1980, he died of some form of a lung ailment um, in Paris. That's sort of the background and biography of Sartre. Now, the background, moving into the background of the play, um, the plague was written in 1947, whereas Les Mouches was written five years earlier in 1942. And it was first presented um, in Paris at uh, the City Theater. And there are some, uh, some people say that it might have actually been presented on a university campus earlier. I couldn't find much about that. Um, Bruno, Bruno may know uh, a little bit more than me on that. Um, but it is essentially a modern retelling of the ancient Sophocles play, Electra. And so to understand the background before we get into the play, Sartre gives us no background. Um, legend has it that the, that the Trojan War originated from a quarrel between the goddesses Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite after Eris, the goddess of strife and discord, gave or them an apple, right? sometimes known as the apple of discord. Um, the apple was marked to be given to the fairest of them all, right? And then Zeus sent the goddesses to Paris of Troy, who judged that Aphrodite was the fairest and should receive the apple. In exchange, Aphrodite made Helen the most beautiful of all the women and the wife of Menelaus of Sparta, fall in love with Para, Paris, who quit Sparta with her and returned to, Roy, to Troy. So he left Sparta um, and you know, there's various interpretations of how this happens. Menelaus' brother Agamemnon, king of Mycenae, then led, led an, ex, uh, an expedition of troops to Troy to besiege the city for 10 years because of this insult, right? There's been many plays written about it, stories, but this is the essentially the background that's going on bef before this. And then the flies show up after Agamemnon's death. Okay. Now in the actual play itself, that's a synopsis of sort of the background of how we got to here. The actual background to the play is the setting is the aftermath of the Trojan War. And Agamemnon, who is one of the one of the main heroes in the Trojan War, his wife Clytemnestra, uh, she held a grudge against Agamemnon because he sacrificed their eldest daughter and you have to bear with me on some of these Greek names, Iphigenia to the goddess Artemis so that he could send his troops with favorable winds to fight in the Trojan War. So he sacrificed his daughter uh, to the goddess. So they, And then 10 years later, Agamemnon returns from the Trojan War. Clytemnestra, um, he returns to her. While Agamemnon is laying siege to Troy, uh, Clytemnestra takes uh, Aegisthus as her lover, and the couple kills Agamemnon upon his return, making Ag Aegisthus king of Messina. And then Aegisthus ruled for seven years before his death at the ha hands of Agamemnon's son. Orestes, and this is sort of what the whole play is about, right? It's about the, about the dynamic that is going on here. And according to Aeschylus, um, Orestes saw Electra's face before the tomb of Agamemnon, where both had gone to perform rites to the dead, where a recognition had occurred, and they arranged how Orestes should accomplish the revenge of his father's death. So, um, and in Aeschylus's account, Orestes and his friend Pilates kills Clymenestra and Aegisthus, the king. And be right before this death, Cly Clytemnestra curses Orestes, and then the, the Furies show up, whose duty it is to punish any violation of the ties of family piety, and they torment the person who does this. 
They then pursue Orestes, urging him to end his life. And that's um, sort of the background that we don't really um, get fully in the play. We get parts of it. Now, the play The Flies uh, was written halfway through the French occupation uh, uh, by Germany. And aside from its existential leanings, the play's presentation of characters who mistakenly think that they are subject to gods with powers beyond human control has frequently been interpreted as a metaphor for French citizens living under the German occupation. And the play, in a sense, is a call to arms and a condemnation of complacency. And perhaps maybe this is why it's read in high schools in the continent. Um, this probably has something to do with it in terms of the call of action. And now we're gonna move into the actual narrative of the play. And again, I'm not an actor, um, but reading uh, of the salient lines is necessary to correlate with Sartre's own philosophy of action. All right, so we're gonna move into the actual play. Now, the setting um, is uh, the setting of the play. The play begins in a public square in Argos, which is in Greece, dominated by a statue of Greece, who is the god of flies and death. And I'm going to use this as Zeus because I'm not an actor, so I need some props. And uh, the image has white eyes and it has blood smeared cheeks. Okay. And the time, uh, the time of year this is, is during what's called Dead Men's Day. And this is a, uh, a, a, a celebration held in remembrance of the murder of, of the former king Agamemnon who, as Sartre puts it, 15 years ago to a day, Agamemnon was murdered. Um, and again, the queen and her lover, Agestus, had killed Agamemnon when he returned. Zeus is disguised at the beginning of the play as someone called Demetrius speaking to Orestes. Now I'm gonna use, com I'm gonna use comedy as Orestes because I don't really have any other props. And I'm going to use tragedy for uh, Electra. So this is going to be uh, uh, this is going to be Orestes here. And when questioned by Zeus, Orestes calls himself Philebus from Corinth. In other words, they're both disguised at the beginning of the play. They're both hidden from each other. Zeus is ostensibly concerned that if Orestes had also not been killed, then he may return one day to Argus to exact revenge for his father's death. And, and Zeus is very concerned about this. And in Greek mythology, Orestes um, is the subject of several ancient Greek plays and of various myths where this actually does happen. Uh, there's a consistency in the plays there. Um, so the beginning of the play is Orestes saying, Orestes saying to Zeus, um, and I thought the gods were just. And Zeus says, steady, my friend, don't blame the gods too hastily. Must they always punish? Wouldn't it be better to use such breaches of the law to point to a moral? Orestes said, and is, it, and is it that what they did? And then Zeus said, they sent the flies. Okay, and the flies again came after the death of Agamemnon. And Zeus then says, would you oust the, them the flies in fate from the favor of the gods, what moreover could you give the people in exchange? Good digressions, good digestions, the gray monotony of provincial life and the boredom, the soul destroying boredom of long days of mild content. Go your way, my lad, go your way. The repose of cities and dead men's souls hangs on a thread, tamper with it and you bring disaster. Zeus is trying to get uh, Orestes to leave. The fear here is that if Orestes does return, then the city will stop repenting and this will anger the gods, specifically the god Zeus. So Orestes turns to his tutor and he says that the bearded fellow Zeus, Zeus in disguise was right. A king should share his subjects memories. So we'll let them be and be gone. But mind you, if there were something I could do, something to give me the freedom of the city I could acquire, even if by a crime, I could acquire their memories, their hopes and fears and fill, the, fill with these the void within me. Yes, even if I had to kill my own mother. So there's sort of the foreshadowing of the crimes that are to be committed and that he's willing to do it even if it is a crime 
crime that uh, you will be pursued um, to your death by the Furies. So we have enter the Queen Cly Clytemestra, which I have here represented by the Isle of Lewis chess set queen, um, who says, most travelers give our city a wide berth. Some go 20 leagues out of their way to avoid it. Were you not warned? The people of the plain have put us in quarantine. They see our repentance as a sort of pestilence and are afraid of being infected. And it is at this point that Electra enters and she says, that's the rule of the game. People will beg you to condemn them, but you must be sure to judge them only on the sins they own to. Their other evil deeds are no one's business and they wouldn't thank you for detecting them. And then as after that, <laughs> Clymenestra says to Orestes, please leave this place. I feel that you are going to bring disaster upon us. You have no wish to, you have no cause to wish us ill. We have done nothing to you. So go, I beg you, by all you hold most, most sacred, By all, you, by all you hold most sacred, for your mother's sake, I beg you, leave. So there's a, deep, there's a deep cave that once a year a stone is rolled away to set, soul the freeze of the, set free the souls of the dead. The people place a, set, uh, place a setting at a table for the souls, and then they beg for forgiveness for the souls of the dead. And this is where scene two of the, of the three scenes begins. The stone is rolled away, a mummery procession begins, Electra does a dance, um, her father is happy, her dead father is happy to see her. Um, she's dressed in white, which is a juxtaposition to the people that are all dressed in black in mourning and, and she's rebuffed for her dance. And Electra says to Orestes, you lured me into thinking one could cure the people here by words. Well, you saw what happened, they nursed their disease They've got to like their sores so much that they scratch them with their dirty nails to keep them festering. Words are no use for such as they. An evil thing is conquered only by another evil thing and only violence can save them. Orestes then says to, to Electra, the gods bear witness that I had no wish to shed their blood. It's not for me that light from now on. I'll take no one's orders, neither man's nor God's. They then hatch a plan to hide in the royal palace and specifically in the bedchamber to kill uh, Clymenestra and Agestius. And that's where we move into the second half of the scene. Agestius, the king, says, I am tired, so tired. For 15 years, I have been upholding the remorse of a whole city and my arms are aching from the strain. For 15 years, I have been dressing apart, playing the scaremonger and the black of my ro robes has seeped through to my soul. He says to Clim Climenestra, you are going to tell me of your remorse. I wish I shared it. It fills out the void of your life. I have no remorse and no man in Argos is sadder, sadder than me. At this point, Orestes jumps out and kills uh, Agestheus or, or, or um, hits him. And as he's dying, Agestheus says, let me look at you. Is it true you feel no remorse? And Orestes says, what do I care for Zeus? Justice is a matter between men and I need no God to teach me it. It is right to stamp you out the foul brute you are and to free the people of Argos from your evil influence. It is right to restore them to their sense of human dignity. Then Orestes slays his mother, Clymenestra, and then he turns to Electra and says, I am now free, Electra. Freedom has crashed down on me like a thunderbolt. Electra says free, but I don't feel free. And you, can you undo what has been done? At this point in the play, a massive amount of flies show up and, it's, and, the, and the act ends as they flee the, the palace to the shrine of Apollo. And this is the third and final scene. As the, as the, as the, um, as the, as, uh, the scene begins, Electra turns old and ages 
And Zeus says to her, in a night, a single night, all the wild rose bloom has left your cheeks. In one night, your body has gone to ruin, lungs, gall, and liver all burnt out. The pride of headstrong youth, see what it has brought to you, poor child. Zeus, your vaunted, your vaunted freedom isolates you from the fold. It means exile. Orestes says, replies to Zeus, I shall not return under your law. I am doomed to have no other law but mine, nor shall I come back to nature, the nature you found good. It, in it are a thousand beaten paths all leading up to you, but I must blaze my trail for I, Zeus, am a man and every man must find out his own way. Nature abhors man and you too, God of gods, ab abhor mankind. I must open the people's eyes. And then Zeus says, poor people, your gift to them will be a sad one of loneliness and shame. You will tear from their eyes the veils I had laid on them and they will see their lives as they are, foul and futile, a barren boon. And Orestes says, and this is the, the final part of me uh, being theatrical, and yet my people, I love you. It was for your sake that I killed, for your sake. I had come to claim my kingdom and you would have, have none of me because I was not of your kind. And see, your faithful flies have left you and come to me. And all the rats raised their head and hesitated as the flies are doing. Look, look at the flies. Then all of a sudden they followed in his train and the flute player with his rats vanished forever. That's the end of the play. And thank you for bearing with me through these lines of the play. But I thought it's impossible. Bravo. Bravo. Well, 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 thank, thank you. You're for, you're far too kind. Um, and so and so, what do we? So um, it's a very power. It's a very powerful statement about uh, human agency and how the only way to um, exert to exercise our human agency is through our own actions. And that's really what we're trying to take away from here in Sartre's philosophy. For Sartre, it's only those people who choose, act, and, and, and accept responsibility for their actions who can be free of nausea, what he calls nausea, free of remorse and ultimately free of the flies. Sartre seizes on this occasion to show how man must accept responsibility for his own life instead of passing it off on outside authorities or even outside gods. In this case, Zeus, the head of the Greek pantheon, is the supreme god. And as such, he's the lord of the flies. He is the lord of the flies, and the king represents the state. In the play, both actively compel the people to serve them. A, a notion that Sartre firmly rejects. There can be no external force which controls our actions, God or state. It is up to the actions of the people to change their fate. And these are the existential themes um, that parallel what we uh, went through with um, Camus in the plague, right? Death and freedom through acts of rebellion. It's very similar to what we read in Camus. And in existentialism, the movement espouses these, these two specific ideas, that the individual has total free will and therefore has the utmost responsibility for their actions. And again, for Sartre, people are defined only by their actions, not by what they say. And secondly, only they are responsible for those actions. The characters in the play ultimately learn that their gods are powerless and that as human beings, they, they possess an innate freedom which cannot be negated. And for Sartre, quote, man is only what he does. Man becomes what he chooses to be. And uh, fine, in, the fi in the final uh, wrapping it up here, since the, since the act of being can only be determined through acts and deeds, a person must make the active choice to follow through with desires and intentions. This is what Sartre calls commitment or engagement. One must be committed to social, <coughs> excuse me, 
political and moral beliefs, or one cannot hope to give himself definition. One's acts are phenomena which can be verified, whereas intentions count for nothing. This takes us back to the principles of phenomenology, the roots of which lay with, with Husserl and Heidegger, and ultimately with the pre-Socratic Greek philosophers. This knowledge of complete freedom often leads to the despair discussed in the play since ethical boundaries disappear and also the practice of religion. And then <clears throat> on one final note, excuse me for a second. <clears throat> on one final note, Clive James, the literary critic in an article for Slate Magazine reckoned, quote, after Camus died prematurely in a car crash, Sartre's uh, Gauchita vision was, was the style setter of French political thought, founding an orthodoxy that still saturates French intellectual today and to a certain extent continues to set a standard of engagement for intellectual life all over the world. Very high praise indeed. And again, I've, I, I apologize that I've slaughtered too many French and Greek words in the presentation. Neither are, are, are my first language after all. And uh, thank you for listening to the, to the presentation and let's begin the conversation. Okay, thank, thanks, Ed, that, that was great. A round of applause for us, very good. Um, um, uh, Ed again has asked me to uh, introduce the discussion, um, just really to punctuate. Um, and to, uh, I'm re I'm really what I, what I would what I picked up on was this notion of being condemned to be free, and the idea that we uh, are not only are able to make our own choices, but we are responsible for them. Um, because that that, feed, that feeds into the idea of just of justice. Um, if we're responsible for our own actions, then um, you know, we can be held. We can be held responsible for what we do. Whereas, if we, if the opposite is the case, then maybe we can't. But my question, really, or the point I would like to make, is that that all sounds fine, except when there is an overlay of context. So, if you take the context that people find themselves in, I mean, let's take our our rest. I, I'm I'm also useless at Greek pronunciation. Orestes was it? If I mean, if somebody if somebody kills your dad, you know, and you and you become the ruler. I mean, that's a context, right? I mean, it's all very well saying he's got free he's got free will. He can do whatever he likes. You know, he can go shopping. He could go out with his girlfriend, or or he could seek revenge for the death of his dad. Who's just, been, who's just been murdered in front of him. And so, well, I mean, so it's all very well saying this guy's got, you know, plenty of choices open to him and he's totally responsible for his own essence. But really, it's got a lot to do with the context. So that's what I would say. It's, it's kind of like, you know, it's not just as straightforward as that. There you go. So let's open the discussion. Who's, who's got something to say on the subject? Not everyone at once. Yeah, well, I will. Yeah. If we're looking at psychology, uh, post Sartre psychology, uh, surely the influences of others on one human being by others, especially when they are young, does that count or is that individual still completely responsible for his actions? Mm. You're introducing Freud to the uh, discussion? Mm. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Breaking up. I said, are you uh, are you introducing Freud to the conversation? Not Freud, but just our knowledge of psychology and the the behavior of others influences us. Um, are we saying, for example, if as this was written in the middle of the war, um, was everyone who supported Nazism, and I'm Polish, so I wasn't exactly for it. Um, responsible personally or not mm. um, so there's no there's no implication there either that um when you say the influence of others um when Sartre's quote about hell hell is other people um but um i guess the influence of others must be very important though, like, on other people. Yeah. are you thinking like collective collective activity rather than just individual activity. So we're not responsible for our own individual actions, 
but it's kind of like it's uh, your influence by what, what other people tell you and what other people encourage you to do. Yes, what I'm saying, we're not solely responsible. No. So like if you take like we're in a machine, like so if you take the Nazis in World War Two, I mean it wasn't the case that you know you you you're in a uniform and you're heading in a certain direction and there's a whole lot of other people doing the same kind of stuff. You aren't actually you haven't actually got a lot of free choice in there. And yes, but before the war they did choose the Nazis and they did you know, sit in enormous stadium supporting Hitler. Now, was this a free choice to every individual or is there something else at play? Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. <clears throat> it's interesting. It's that thing, because that was the defense, wasn't it, for, for uh, the uh, the war trials, is that, you know, people would uh, say, well, it's all very well, but my, my superior told me to do it. And so I was just carrying out orders. And if I didn't do it, I would have been killed. So you've got that sort of no, total I'm not talking of, that. of free of free. That work. is your choice. That that is your choice. What I'm talking of influences are mass or yeah. trauma from childhood, say. Okay. Kind of upbringing. So are you are you saying that Orestes was sort of obligated uh, to 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 revenge, to, to exact revenge because his father was killed and an imposter took the throne. And since his mother uh, was also participant in the crime that, that he was obligated to kill her as well. You're saying that he was driven by something external to himself. I'm saying that perhaps the choice is partial, not entirely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think just to come back to Sartre, I think Sartre says you uh, you um, you should take uh, responsibility for for your actions and um, only by even I mean even, even by committing murder or a sort of very strong actions can you change the future or can you bring a future of, about and that that's also partly. Um, what I learned at school that he wrote the play to motivate people um, and as long as you are uh, aware and take all the responsibility upon yourself um, he Sartre thinks is justifiable so basically he was asking uh, French people and the French resistance uh, to to act um, and even if that um, um, demands the life of innocent people. That's where Sartre goes goes very is, is very um, radical almost, isn't he? And that that's a question where you then have to question the, the morality um, of the whole thing. Okay, thanks, Veronica. My, Michael, you've got your hand raised. Michael? Oh, well, I was going to chip in a little later on, but I'll chip in now if that's okay. okay. Uh, unfortunately, when I was at college and university, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear fine, yeah. Yes. When I was at college and university, I wasn't given Les Mouches. I was asked to read We Clo, No Exit, and compare it to the play that was written five years later by Beckett, uh, Waiting for Godot, because We Clo is about three people in the afterlife. But I, all I wanted to do was read a little story from Sartre himself, which I think illustrates the discussion that you're having. Sartre explained uh, what he meant by the anguish of choice, the anguish of freedom, that is, through the true story of a student who'd come to ask his advice during the Second World War. Hate to go on about the war. I mean, we're always going on about the war, but never mind. This young man had to make a very difficult decision. He could either stay at home to look after his mother, or he could run off and try to join the French resistance and fight to save his country from the Germans. This was the most difficult decision of his life and he wasn't sure what to do. If he left his mother, she would be vulnerable without him. He might not succeed in getting to the resistance fighters before being caught by the Germans and then the whole attempt to do something noble would be a waste of energy and of his life. But if he stayed at home with his mother, he'd be letting others do the fighting for him. What should he do, he asked Sartre. What would you do? What advice would you give him? And Sartre said, 
he told the student that he was free and that he should choose for himself. Mm. Whatever the whatever the consequences. There you go. That's what we. That's our lot, mate. And that's what we have to do, mate. Get on with it. Do it. And th that seems to be the takeaway from that little story. <laughs> How it relates to Le Mouche and the God of Flies and the flies themselves, well, I guess it, there must be a step across from there to one place or another. And thank you, Ed, great, great presentation, by the way. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. So I hope that story uh, resonates a little bit because it's from the man himself. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I. I don't want to dominate the conversation here because I just spoke for half an hour, but uh, absolutely. Uh, Sartre says, as Michael is saying, that um, people become by acting. And so uh, there is no, there is, by, by not acting, you become something as well, right? So uh, th through, through participating and doing the correct thing, you are becoming the person that you should be. I mean, I think he, the, the person would have no choice in that sense, right? But to go into the war. But the, but the discussion around individual or collective responsibility is a very Im, important one that was important then and urgent now. Yeah. As well. On a way, has it? I wonder whether I could make a comment just about this issue about context, which came up earlier on, um, also with what Mark was saying and Ava was saying. It, I mean, if you go back to the people who were piling into stadiums and supporting Hitler, um, or indeed the whole movement behind Nazism, it was partly because what they perceived to have happened to Germany in the First World War and the Weimar Republic, so it was partly, if you like, taking revenge of some sort for some kind of evil that they felt had been visited upon. Germany in the past. So that was certainly contextual. Uh, whether the Versailles Treaty was right or wrong, we don't have to say that now, but it was felt that it was uh, grievously unjust. And it was also an attempt to uh, overcome what many people felt was some kind of victimization of Germany, let us say by the Jews. I mean, however distasteful and unpleasant and wrong that is, that was a widely felt feeling. Um, so again, that's uh, utterly contextual, isn't it? That uh, the people that were piling into the stadiums or supporting Hitler or joining the SS at an early stage, uh, partly genuinely and, and partly um, in their imagination, they were feeling they were writing a wrong. I mean, however horrible that was. And, and then when you come to the Second World War and you come to uh, the, the tremendous uh, loyalty that the army officers felt to their army, to the Wehrmacht. Well, Hitler was the chief of the Wehrmacht. And so those soldiers who did um, try to assassinate Hitler in a rather bungled attempt on the 20th of July, 1944, were, were riven by this feeling, whether they were being disloyal. It wasn't just the fear for their own protection and that of their families. Many of them were hanged and shot and murdered by the Nazis afterwards. But it was also a genuine feeling that they were doing wrong. You know, they, they, they were going against their, their duty. So again, I don't think that they were, uh, they, that they had free will in that case at all. And then Sartre, Veronica knows much more about it than I do, but I would have thought that a wily chap like Sartre when he's writing a play being performed uh, under the noses of the occupiers, uh, that he would be careful enough to put in a lot of ambiguity into, into that play. Uh, mm -hmm. And he would feel that this is a play that, depending on how the war went, it could be interpreted in, in several different ways after uh, the war ended. And he wouldn't have been alone. Uh, many people in uh, German-occupied Paris uh, had great ambivalence. Mitterrand was, of course, one of them. He, he won the, uh, the, the award for a Petank, model uh, a medal for being very loyal to the Petain regime but he was also very much working for the resistance they were trying to play it at both both ends as many people would I think many people in England would do exactly the same huge amount of ambiguity again you can't say that was perfect free will because people were trying to play a very delicate clever double game in many cases so so those are my three points Mm, yeah. 
Yeah, very much so, David. I mean, I, um, I mean, I'm thinking the, um, the 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 conversations revolving around whether or not people have free will, actually. Um, and I don't know whether that's in line with existentialism, but it seems to me that actually, if you take too much of a hard line and you say that people are totally responsible, first of all, first of all, there's a kind of call to action in there. This, you have free will and therefore there's a responsibility on you to exercise it. Well, there's a question. Is that right? I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. Okay, so we've got free will and, and there's a kind of call to action. So there's like a pressure saying, therefore you have to use it. And then say, well, okay, um, but there's no other, we're going to ignore all other influences on you. Um, you are um, complete, you have a blank slate in, in the sense that you can do whatever you like. Um, and in that context, we will hold you responsible. So you get the kind of concept of justice. You get kind of free will on the one hand, and you get justice. And justice actually is collective. So you got, it's like, you know, somebody else, other people are gonna, gonna judge you. I mean, typically a jury is 12 and you, know, you have lawyers and courtrooms and all those kind of things. So justice is kind of collect collectivity catching up with individual free will. So let's just say that we can do whatever we like, but we have to be careful actually, because justice will judge us. Well, yeah, but the very fact that there is justice, there is collective responsibility, there is collective punishment for certain actions, suggests that actually you, you, don't, you have to be aware of those. So did the person who had free will not know about collective responsibility and collective justice? Well, no, they didn't. They, they clearly knew about that. So, so you can't say you have absolutely a blank slate, you can do whatever you like, and you're totally responsible for your own actions. Um, but, but bear in mind, bear in mind, and you, and you don't know about collective responsibility, and you don't know about justice, which is just around the corner. And you know, so, just to give, to give an example, I mean, I, I I'm in a hurry, so I think you know I'll park my car wherever I like. So I stop and I park on a double yellow line, and uh, and I leave it. Uh, I leave the doors and windows open, then I rush off because uh, that's what I need to do. So well, and then when I come back, um, there's somebody towing my car away. I get arrested. Um, but, but I know about those things in advance. And because I know about those things in advance, that would influence whether I did that or not. So you can't say that I've got free will to do whatever I like, where I park my car, wherever I like, because I know about those other things. So there is that kind of, there always, always that context and there's always that influence. Well, Mark, then you get into a huge um, discussion about what is uh, freedom anyway. You know, lots of philosophers have um, talked about that uh, or written about that um, and at length, uh, you know, uh, some say uh, freedom is just a sort of um, that you have choices or, or in, and in Sartre's case, it, it is actually freedom from, uh, from something, um, whereas you also have to, like, if you read, uh, for example, um, uh, Erich Fromm, who, um, who talks, uh, written a huge book about the fear of freedom because um, it isolates you and, and, uh, and everything else. But there is also uh, the freedom to, to do something whereas Sartre's freedom is just a, a more kind of a negative freedom, I freedom from something. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's a huge discussion what is freedom and, and how, how free do you feel? But Sartre says, um, as long as you're aware that you are free, then you are free. And, 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 um, and that is the essence of what you should be in, in, in your life to, to, be aware, uh, to be aware that you're free and, and to act accordingly and, and be responsible for, for, your, for your actions. Yeah, I mean, and and uh, it's it's great you say that because what, whatever happened, whatever happened to the '60s, you know, you had this stuff, you know, we had World War II, and then we we got the the '60s, and '60s was a, 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 one of two decades in in that century where young people took over, and young people, so it was the '20s, the Roaring Twenties, ended in something like disaster, and the '60s also kind of ended, well, came crashing down. Um, were the two decades when young people took over and, you know, we had hippies and flower power 
power and you're a free baby. And we had the 1968 riots in Paris mm -hmm. um, as parodied by um, Austin Powers. You know, we were free, baby. You know, we could do whatever we liked. But actually, the the truth of the matter the truth of the matter is, where did that all go? So, so maybe coming back to Ed. I mean, you know, Sartre. What? Okay, he said that, um, and he said that you know we're condemned to be free. It was called to action. But where did that all go? Because he was also quite political, wasn't he? Wasn't he influenced by Marx? And and he had uh, like a socialist. Uh, influence and France of course is actually a very much kind of you know polarized country it's uh, it's uh, on the one hand it's quite they're, they're quite revolutionary um, the French I mean they love to get out there in their tractors and block the roads and call for things to be changed and they're always going on strike allegedly and you know they're fairly they're fairly uh, but they're vaccine hesitant you know they're, they're kind of like you know that revolutionary spirit is there but on the other hand they also admire um, Napoleon. Napoleon wasn't kind of a, he put down a revolution. So they, he's a kind of like right wing guy who, who brought back slavery and you know, tried to conquer other people and spread, take over the whole of Europe um, in a kind of like pre Hitler esque um, uh, way. Uh, Interestingly, he fell in Russia as well. So he was invading Russia that also was the downfall of Hitler. But, but so I think, you know, if you take that, so my question really was around about, okay, well, I, I hear what you're saying about existentialism, but actually it didn't really end terribly well, um, this notion of freedom. And actually we've kind of moved on to, to actually believe the opposite. So actually, we actually believe that people aren't free. And that, you know, this thing about, you know, you. Well, like I was saying, I mean, I'm not free to go and park my car badly in the middle of Wimbledon, Wimbledon High Street. And probably a good thing, too. But I mean, the well, thing about you that are. is... <laughs> uh, you, are to, you are free to do it, but you have to bear the consequences. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, it comes justice and responsibility. Exactly. I mean, yeah, I mean, so I'm not so sure that we, from where we are now that we... I, that, that, that I have free will to do anything I like, really. I mean, yeah, I don't think I don't feel that. I think we're uh, we're conditioned by a number of different things. We're held back by a number of different things. We are socialized into believing that that we are, you know, just one of many people, and we have to respect other people. And you know, I don't, I don't bring up climate change, but I mean, how free are we to pollute, for example? Well, Mark, can I just say uh, answer with Sartre? Sartre says you are free to do that, and you can park your um, car in the middle of the high street and leave all the doors open you, um, uh, and you just have to be bear you know you have to take responsibility for your actions and that sets you free so in Sartre's sense you are free uh, to do it as, as long as you um, take responsibility for your actions. Um, yeah I understand that. that but what I'm saying is that the knowledge of the the, the various restraints that are yes. placed on people is the thing which takes away your freedom. Yeah, it's but you don't want to bear you don't want to bear the consequences. You don't it, want it, to it, take responsibility. That's why. It, it doesn't. It doesn't. Does it, Mark? Um, I'm just. Uh, I'm actually agreeing with Veronica here from uh, fabulous. The other, fabulous from the other room. Fabulous. I mean, you're you're sounding like one of those people on, on LBC that says lots of deliberately overdone things just to get the viewers and the listeners to to come in because what you say. I Mark, believe it. Yeah. I mean, what you, you, you what you say cannot be true. It cannot be true because if everybody was conditioned like you, then they wouldn't need to be any regulations or any police forces. It's quite patently true that not everybody is socialized uh, and therefore people do enjoy the freedom of will that Veronica is saying they have. No, but I think you mix up things there because everybody is an individual and everybody has their own um, um, kind of concept or, or, or freedom. Um, who, who are you talking to, Mark or me? Uh, you oh. <laughs> and Mark, but you know, I'm, I was really playing devil's advocate. I was just replying to Mark what Sartre says, but uh, uh, obviously to some extent, I agree very much what um, Mark says, because there is this dichotomy that chucks the position that people want to be free, but at the same time, they, they want to belong somewhere. They, they, they have a strong sense of belonging to a, a group or a, a system. And, and that is almost um, a counterpole to, to freedom. 
Uh, yeah, uh, we've got a couple of hands. Uh, we've got quite a few hands raised here, so this is uh, conversation is, is starting to get get some traction. Uh, Bruno, you wanna, do you want to uh, unmute yourself? Yeah, thank you. All right. Sure. Um, yeah, a couple of observations. Thanks very much for the talk. I must admit, I read this at university and was delighted to dig out my old um, copy of Limouche. And, and find that I've just become a lot stupid as I've got older. I found it turgid and so difficult to read. I, I actually put it in the bin. I thought I'm never going to read this again. But um, and there's loads of notes. There's loads of notes in it. I'd clearly read it, uh, you know, 40 years ago, whenever it was. And um, but but a couple of things uh, on on it all the same that I kind of remember because I I studied such um, under a professor Mansell at Southampton University. And his, um, you know, to, to go back to the, the war, someone did say, uh, uh, you know, talk about the occupation. And Sartre did say we were never so free as under the occupation. But just to take a step back, if, if we think of his being a nothingness, he's got this concept of things that are for themselves, such as stone or a rock or a tree, can never be free because it just is what it is. And in his concept of human beings, which is the opposite of something that is what it is, or things that are in themselves, there's this idea of freedom because we're always striving to be something else. So in order to be something else, in order to recognize the potential for change in us, we must have the freedom and the ability to change. And what he actually, as I understand his concept of freedom, it's it's that a man on a, an, the last man in the world could not be free because everything's open to him. The greater the constraints that are placed upon you, the greater the possibility for you to express freedom through choice by either accepting those constraints or fighting against them. Hence his you know, comment that we were never so free as under the occupation. And so to my mind, the way I see it, freedom for, for, for self is, is, is actually, it's, it's all about the choice. It's the greater the choice, the greater the freedom. And Ed, you might know better than I do, but I, I recall Spinoza as having said, even a prisoner can express his freedom by choosing to walk into the jail rather than to be thrown into it. And this is how I see Sartre's idea of freedom, that we all, no matter what is imposed upon us, we have the choice to either fight against it or to accept it willingly, you know, whether or not we, we agree with that. And I think it was Veronica who said about, Actually, not to be called. Um, you know, society places. Sartre went on to change his mind because um, he flirted with Marxism and wrote this wonderful thick book called Critique of Dialectical Reason, which um, I tried. To, well, I read in parts, but I couldn't read it in its entirety. Actually, our freedom is limited, so I am. Anywhere, else. but if I wait for a bus where there's no bus stop, it's a pretty stupid thing to do. So our choice is actually determined by the people and the social actions that have gone behind us. And having said in being a nothingness or implied that freedom is this absolute value, in a social context, it's actually less absolute and qualified by the decisions we as a society have made. And that was his move to, towards a uh, away from this pure individualism of existentialism as expressed in being a nothingness to something more of a kind of a socialist collective idea of the human being in society that he had later in his life. Mm. Mm. That's all I wanted to say. Good. Uh, more hands, Mike Collins and Val. Let's go with Val. I'm unmuted now. Let's go I'll, with I'll, be very, I'll be brief for a word. Who's that Val? Bruno said. Oh, Thank you. Michael, go ahead. I, I was going. I, I'm. I'm with Bruno. Bruno said it all because I, I'm with Bruno. I I read it 40 years ago at university. I didn't understand it then. I hated it then, and I really didn't want to read it again. And I'm so sorry because this is my fault. I brought it up at the last minute. You, Veronica, you and it, Veronica though. ran with it for some reason. So. Um, <laughs> I, I was going not take issue, but with what Mark said, I don't think that your freedom is denied if you have to follow a few basic social rules like where the parking lines are. I don't think that has anything to do with our choice of freedom and our ability to be free. 
Um, and, and I think that's quite a big, big, I, I, I drive that, you know, I drive that tiny little smart car. I can be really cheeky in my smart car. So it, it, it was resonant with me, your parking. Mm. I can park on the pavement and nobody minds because this car is so small. I'm never going to block it you know, for a pram to get through. But I don't think it um, it deprives of deprives us of our of our freedom to choose if there are some certain social just sensible rules around where we park. Um, but what I was going to actually say is I have this beautiful dog. Some of you have met her. She's called Callista, and Callista means beautiful in Greek. We call her Callie, but she's Callista. Um, and Callista was the daughter, or Callisto was the daughter of, I'm like you, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but she was the daughter of uh, King Lyceon. Um, she was also a follower of, of, of Artemis, so she was a bit cross that, you know, Helen was chosen to go to Troy. Um, but she was uh, basically seduced by Zeus, and my internet connection is some stable, so I hope you can hear me. She was seduced by Zeus, and then Zeus's wife, Hera, um, turned her into a bear. And I've always thought this story is fantastic because I would like to be turned into a bear. If I was going to be turned into anything, uh, my choice would be a bear. I mean, that she actually does look a little bit like a bear in her face, you know, one of the beautiful little black bears. Looks quite sweet, but it's very ferocious. Um, <laughs> and my point was, you know, some of her, uh, gave us this this freedom of choice as as human beings, but I'm not sure that he he allowed us a choice when we have, as ever said, we are influenced totally by other people, those people that we hate, l'enfer, c'est les autres, um, and um, and and by our deep religious beliefs, which are very, very, very difficult to set aside for a lot of people. So Sartre to me was just, <laughs> I, I just never got him. Um, he, he, to me, he was a communist. And, um, you know, that, that, that's another issue, I'm sure. Ed, you will have a, uh, anyway, I've, I've spoken too much and Michael still wants to say something, but uh, thank you, Bruno, I'm with you. I hated it 40 years ago and I still hate it today. And it's really boring and trashy. And why would he write that? I, I don't know. <laughs> I'd have to say I liked Waiting for Godot more than We Club, but there we are. <laughs> um, thank you. What I was going to say was Bruno's pretty much said it all, but there are different freedoms. There's a freedom, and, and as a philosophical tenet, you either believe in it as a preordained condition, so we are free, and then there's what you do with it, and whether, whether you aspire to and can earn something called freedom through your actions. They are potentially different. But I should also close by saying that when we'd had a couple more than we should have done, we used to move the bus stops around Leeds when I was a student <laughs> just to see what would happen. <laughs> so thanks, Bruno. You've reminded me of those good days. Um, yeah. All right, Bruno has, a, Bruno has a rejoinder to that. So you've, yeah, well, you've stimulated. Just say, actually, um, Val, I didn't enjoy that play, and I, I didn't really enjoy Sartre's uh, books, but his, his notions of, you know, existence precedes essence, I, I just thought those were the th three most liberating words I'd ever read. And I would go so far as to say, you know, they changed my life. Oh. And they made me feel that anything was possible. And um, not that I was ever a pessimist, but I, I think if, if one puts aside the man he was, because I didn't think he was a very nice man, put aside some of the novels and the plays, but just focuses on the, the, the extent to which he seeks to empower you through existentialism, yeah. then I think it's, you know, I like to look at it that way. And I like to see existentialism very much on a, line, on a par with Buddhism effectively, or, or Eastern, uh, Eastern uh, kind of philosophy of empowerment, atheistic philosophy of empowerment. And there's a chap called Frankel who wrote Man's Search for Meaning. Um, oh. And he, yeah, has anyone come across that? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. yeah. So, so he, he was an existentialist philosopher who practiced philosophy in Vienna, having, I think, been one of the only or very few people to survive four concentration camps 
And he claims that he survived those because he believed in nothing. And the people who suffered most or suffered first were the people who saw their belief system shat shattered. Mm. And uh, what got him through was um, knowing that, um, you know, nothing existed before he did or no values existed before he did and he could create his own. And he went on, by all accounts, to be a very successful um, psychoanalyst in Vienna who helped a lot of people come to terms with their traumas by telling them that nothing mattered. I mean, I'm really simplifying here, I know, that, um, you know, that they were, they, they were free to choose their own values. But um, anyway, that's a good book. Man's Search for Meaning is, is, is quite an interesting read. Um, we've got a kind of new, new oxymoron here, which is um, enjoying Sartre. I mean, this is a guy who wrote a book called Nausea. He wrote a book. He wrote something called Being and Nothingness. You know, he wrote, they wrote The Flies, which of course by popular acclaim is uh, probably one of the worst things anybody's ever read. I mean, this is a guy, I mean, so it's not so much that, it's not, it's not so much he was trying to be enjoyable. He was trying to shock people um, and to stir them into action. But what I would, what I would what, come back to about this point about context is that what was Sartre's context? And his context was very much kind of, you know, the World War II and, um, you know, what happened afterwards and the rise of socialism, well, um, communism and the rise of socialism throughout, throughout Europe. And so he, even himself, even though he's advocating these things, he's advocating them in that context. And as Ed said, you know, given towards the end of his life, he probably changed his mind because the context had changed. I mean, you had, you had the 70s. He, he, I wonder if he'd have made it into the 80s, what he would have made of that. I wonder what he would have made of Margaret Thatcher. And, uh, you know, one of the things capitalism. One of the things you bring up, Mark, is you know, is when I never studied him at all. And I have several degrees in philosophy, right? He was always ignored the schools that I went to. Um, the way that he's always been understood in my mind is as the first celebrity philosopher, right? The guy that sat on the bank of the Seine and drank coffee with you know someone who was arguably as famous as him showed up at all of the you know museums and the great events and and sort of became the image of what it meant to do philosophy right it's almost like um it's almost like that famous comment by Wittgenstein which says you know, I am sitting in the garden with a philosopher a man with another philosopher someone walks into the garden and overhears us overhears us uh, saying, I, I know that that's a tree in front of us, pointing to a tree. This man turns to me and he says, uh, is this man mad? And I say, no, we are only doing philosophy, right? So this is kind of like, Sartre is like the sort of embodiment of this nonsensical sort of meandering around in philosophy and what it means to do philosophy. Um, in fact, being in nothingness is considered to be, you know, almost impenetrable, whereas um, in my mind, the significance of Sartre lays in the fact that he took German um, phenomenology and he made it widely accessible to the French public. That's his main contribution in the history of philosophy, is that he brought German philosophy in, into, into France. And, and it did that historically, did that, was that the end of French philosophy? Well, well, <laughs> because, because actually French philosophy flourished up until Sartre. And then, and well, I mean, then they, uh, they, they were famous, famously philosophical people um, until the point of really of existentialism. Well, uh, Derrida and Derrida's French, French, arguably he's, uh, Foucault and Derrida, are arguably the two most dominant philosophers in the, th the world of thinking today. So okay. I see just the opposite happened. Okay, okay. Oh, good. Okay, good. Oh. Anybody else? Anybody else have something they want to they want to contribute? Roland, you look like you're. Well, no, I, sorry, I, I unlike yourselves, I, I never studied uh, existentialism or Sartre. Uh, anywhere and until I was prompted by you to read um, mm. No Exit. Mm. And um, um, I find it 
terribly confused, contradictory, particularly uh, when he starts with his concept of freedom of the individual and then ends up being a Marxist. Um, that's a, I don't think he's terribly clear about his own life, but what I was thinking about is what good has existentialism done to the world? Um, what benefits do we get out of that philosophy now? Mm. Mm. Uh, that, I mean, philosophy has got to be useful, and I don't feel that Sartre was useful, apart from uh, examining uh, ideas like nothingness. Well, you can't discuss, discuss nothingness because we don't exist in nothingness. We exist in this moment. So you, you can't look at this philosophy in the round because we can't see beyond the other side of the veil. So um, I find him, uh, well, I, I picked up on obviously the famous phrase, hell are other people. And I thought, well, hell are other people when they make choices you don't agree with. And I think that's probably what he was getting at there. Um, those were my, ah, the other thing, um, <laughs> read no exit. It starts with a valet. The valet was not doing his job he didn't offer any food or drinks. Food, eating, which is fundamental to life, didn't even come into that play. And the valet, I blame the valet for making it a very bad play. <laughs> <laughs> ah, and that's the other thing. Sartre is not funny. No, he's not. <laughs> I'm not a funny yeah. philosopher. He's no, miserable. No. He's not funny. Huh? He's miserable. Uh, very miserable. <laughs> but he wrote a book, as Mark just said, he wrote a book called Nausea. <laughs> this is a guy who famously sat around in cafes smoking, you know, smoking and talking, talking about nothingness and nausea. Oh, terrible. My, my only regret, I mean, I started going to Paris when I was about 1972, and I went, went quite a lot until about 1977. I hadn't realized he died in 1980. Maybe I could have met him. That would have been well, wonderful. He did. That would have been wonderful. But he was probably one of those guys hanging around in bars in the, the, on the left bank, uh, uh, in, a cloud of, in a cloud of Gaulois smoke. It must have been an amazing character. Oh, I mean, the very fact that years later we're talking about what he said, you know, what he wrote about, is surely what it's about. I mean, you know, he's he's a guy trying to provoke people into action, but also trying to provoke us into thinking about things, and that, of course, is a great contribution. Well, we, I, I think we think about things without Sartre. We don't need Sartre to think about things. Don't need philosophers, but not in that direction. I mean. <laughs> He was quite significant, wasn't he, to 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 show an, another way of, of living, like, for example, denying that there is God and that it's all up to you. And so I think he set a marker um, um, in, uh, uh, when I was young. He set a marker to to think about these things. Uh, and um, and it's unfortunate, Mark, that you won't meet him in heaven as as um, there isn't one. As, uh, as he doesn't believe in heaven and hell, so you won't meet him at all. Exactly, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a shame. Blessing in disguise for Mark. <laughs> um, yeah, but, I, but I certainly would have liked to have met him in person, that's for sure. What are we talking about here? Who does so I, my, uh, I just realized I've had such a poor internet connection because it's been working off my phone for some silly reason. Ah. Um, the the um, uh, sorry I forgot what I was going to say it's, uh, Roland you're saying you know what, what's what, what I think you were saying what's the point of um, you know what what um, what can you take from existentialism or or, or how can it um, in everyday how can life it help you in, in in everyday life I was a teacher in Toulouse and in Aix en Provence in the early eighties and I met teachers who spoke with passion of the 68 revolution. There was a teacher in my school, a young woman who was older than me at the time, but you know, who said, uh, you don't understand, she said, I was in Paris and I burnt my bra. And for many of those young people then, that wouldn't have been possible without Sartre. Sartre and a lot of actually, a, a lot of the um, folk singers in particular, for want of a better term, 
really underscored that um, that student revolution and Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir were there at the barricades yeah. and and that message of, of liberty and freedom and mm. do not take your values from the state do not accept the values that the church places upon you yeah. adopt them if you wish but you've got to get there your own way yeah. those were absolutely thrilling and and um, you know they they kind of that 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 existentialism of choosing your own values and not having others not allowing those of others to be imposed upon you changed lives yes but let's let's look at um, san francisco at the same time um i'm not sure whether they were reading sartre but they were taking off their bras anyway they were doing that in woodstock um <laughs> you didn't have to read sartre yeah, they're, they're american rolling Ah, yes, oh, but, <laughs> but there, there were also human beings with a different point of view, right or wrong. That's it. I think, you know, one of the things that you have to look at since we're talking about where he fits in the canon is um, arguably deconstruction came about because of this, right? I mean, if we are now free to be you know, liberated from the constraints of the state, we are now liberated from the constraints of formalized religion, and we, some of us will experience this as a nausea, right? Because we can't quite deal with the fact that these sort of structural frameworks are around us, giving us meaning in life. Um, we can do, do one of the things Veronica was talking about, the fear, of free, the fear from freedom. This is why some people like tyranny, because it gives them a meaning and a structure in their life. Or it leads to deconstruction, which is what you have going on worldwide and has been going on really since about 1966 when Derrida came around and started you know, the post-structuralist movement. You now have in all of the universities in the United States, you have the Western canon being torn to shreds. Um, it's being decolonized here in England. You have all of the, uh, you have the Greek and the Latin um, classics are now uh, being stripped out of universities. And you have uh, this whole uh, deconstruction that's uh, of what we have come to accept as sort of our common uh, lineage is being torn to shreds. So this is really the legacy of uh, what you see in terms of uh, the French philosophy that has come after Sartre and it came directly out of France. I did my PhD on Paul Ricoeur, which is on theories of interpretation and I, I saw all of this come through uh, France in the last 40 years, well, 50 years now. Can you, sorry, could I come in again? Yeah. <laughs> um, be before Sartre, there were other uh, thinkers like Gramsci um, and also Marxists who also believed in, um, in a sense, deconstructing societies. And I think those preceded um, Sartre who then also that's probably why he was attracted in part to, to Marxism, because what we are seeing is um, very subtle ways of um, undermining our society, Western societies, by, uh, by taking apart the system, which is being done very successfully. Um, and I, th I think it's, it's, it's Marxism that is doing it, or that, that idea of Marxism rather than Sartre. You mean the dialectic of Marxism? Is that what you're talking about? The dialectic that's used by Marx, or I, I think it's the it's it's Marx. It's it's people like Gramsci, and I think there's a, a German philosopher in the sixties whose name escapes me now, or a German activist who um, worked out a way of well, not worked out a way. It was just very simple. You just pick away at the system until it starts to crumble away. Now that the system is not a particularly strong system to start off with, basically capitalism, um, but, but it, it works. But um, if you are determined to undermine it, uh, you can, and that is happening now. It's certainly happening throughout universities in America and certainly in this country, not so much in Europe, but certainly um, uh, I, I see it happening. Um, but I think it's, I don't know how it's happened, but it's certainly by using Marxist ideas um, to undermine uh, the West. And um, it's successful because we can now see that the workshop of the world is China. 
and that's been partly helped by uh, American globalist companies. Um, and uh, you know, this country used to be a manufacturing hub 100 years or so ago. It no longer is. Um, we are reliant to, on the East who organize things possibly in a Marxist way, which works when you've got one and a half billion people. Uh, it certainly doesn't work in India where uh, it's, it's, it's a different sort of situation. But I, I think that, that that is what is happening. It's not necessarily Sartre that's helped this, but I think it's the the Marxist way of, of doing things. Hmm. Now, I'm not I'm I'm not I'm apolitical. I'm just an observer. I try to, I tend to be an, an outsider because that's the way I am. Um, um, that doesn't mean I'm free, by the way, because I was making a note here. I don't agree with, with Sandra because I think you cannot be free as long as you rely on other people who feed you, protect you, or cure you. So that's a lot of baloney, I'm afraid. Um, so we do need other people. Okay, thanks, mm -hmm. thanks, Roland. Uh, Brian, Brian wants to say something. Brian? Uh, yes, please. Um, that was a good introduction because amongst all of my knowledgeable um, fellow members, uh, I'm a humble mechanical engineer. Um, and so um, I had to uh, listen to, well, no, I, I went to Bristol University and it was so small then that uh, I was surrounded by uh, art students and they, they did me a, a hell of a lot of good. Um, so uh, what I'm trying to say is- Long live the A big pun? Long Hello? live the Arnolfini. Bristol. Oh, good. <laughs> great, great place. Love it. Ah, yeah. Um, uh, I was there fairly early on, like uh, in the 1950 something. Um, and it was very, very small, as I was saying. So um, what I wanted to point out was that I uh, read the play for the first time, uh, just like it. So I'm, I sort of at least uh, started there. And I, I, I thought it was great. Um, it reminded me of Godot, and I thought, well, Beckett probably wrote Godot uh, on the back of that, but I, I found I out that um, they, they were born within a year of each other, which sort of surprised me. Um, I just loved the idea of um, having one's mind stretched into exactly. the thinking of uh, what it's like um, for those three characters to be stuck in a room, um, not just for a small time, but forever, just like home, so to speak, only worse. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I, I think we're being possibly a little bit um, uh, precious yeah. about, about, uh, about, uh, about uh, Sartre. Um, he provided me with entertainment and thought, and I, I had to really stretch my mind to understand it, but then I'm an only, an, only an engineer. That's it. So it's a useful exercise then, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, David, David uh, Marsh, are you there? I don't see you. He's got his hand raised, and then we'll go to Michael Collins. Hmm. David, are you there? Oh yes, yes, yeah. I, I'm, I'm here just uh, lis listening away. No, I just wanted to make a comment about uh, what Bruno said just now about uh, Sartre being responsible for, say, undermining uh, capitalism or Britain's manufacturing capacity. I, I really think that's a complete load of nonsense. And if, <laughs> no, that, if that was Ro I, I didn't make that comment, by the way. Was Roland. 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 So, so, Roland. Sorry, no, sorry. Roland. I, I, I take that. Uh, yes, I, I'm sure when we uh, get to the garden party, we'll we'll have a drink uh, on all this. Be uh, well, well, well. First of all, uh, you could say it actually is Marx's theory that capitalism will, it, in the end, bury itself. You you could say that people are using their free will within capitalism to to do their damnedest to destroy it. If, I don't think it's happening yet, but you could argue that climate change, uh, much of it is man-made, is uh, undermining the system. On the other hand, you could also say that capitalism will provide a way out of it. Uh, there's lots of uh, recent arguments to show that uh, actually making all the necessary adjustments and 
lowering energy use and so on won't cost anything like as much as people have thought because of the much lower cost these days of renewable energy. So I think it's a bit too early to just call out the uh, the, the, the death uh, march of capitalism. And also, if you're talking about China, surely it's Confucius, Confucianism, not Marxism, not no. Marxism that is driving uh, China. Um, uh, because it, uh, there's, there's clearly uh, some uh, subscription to the thoughts of Marx, but there's also a lot of uh, homely Chinese recipes conceived over three or 4,000 years in there. I, I think uh, it, it's a lot more than Marxism that we see being developed in, in China. They've also taken on board very much all the things that they thought went wrong with the Soviet Union. So I think it's a concoction of different theories and different cultures and different recipes uh, going back to imperial China that, that actually is, is driving that on. And then who's to say that what China is doing, it, it, it may indeed have hollowed out bits of uh, the British industry, but we've been doing that for 150 years. The, the first uh, worries about the decline of British manufacturing industry, that goes back 150 years. Um, and that's got nothing to do with Marx. Uh, it was it just because we had outlived our ability to, to do all the things that we used to be able to do in a very competitive way on the world stage. So I think it's a gross, grotesquely simplistic, al although uh, no doubt animating, uh, and good for Sartre's own self-esteem, were he to be listening to all this beyond the grave, uh, to, to say the things that you've done, Roland. So anyway, I look forward to having a drink with you at the garden party. May I, may I come back to you? No. May I? Yeah, of course, of course, Roland. Yeah, far away. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, claiming that uh, it was the end of capitalism, far from it. But I think the Chinese have been very, very clever because they've com com combined not Confucianism, but Taoism, which is basically the belief that change is fundamental to life. And I was looking at a site recently, uh, the, the, the Chinese uh, political party site, where there was an interesting uh, uh, part, um, where there's a one man who is responsible for, for wiping out faith in China. And um, he said that Marxism is, is uh, he combined Marxism with change. In other words, Marxism with Taoism, which is older than Confucianism. And they are very clever. They, the Chinese move with the times and they take the best of what's in the world and adapt it to their system for their people. And I think that's what's happened. So they've taken capitalism and, uh, and combined it with, let's say, Marxism or, or Taoism to, and to make it work for their society. Um, that's really what I, I really want to do. Well, I, I think that's much better what you've just said now. That, that's not so simplistic. So no, 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 no. Another, another reason to have a drink. Yeah. <laughs> David, David seems to want a drink. Did you say Mike Collins? Oh, Mike Collins has got his hand up. Yeah, Mike, Mike, Mike. Yeah, Mike. He's a drink. I, I've literally got my hand up because I was going to suggest, as I did a couple of garden parties ago, although I haven't made any yet, that this discussion requires some elderflower champagne. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very much so. And I raised my glass to Roland because I remember our discussions were a couple of years ago in Wimbledon Library, which I'd like to revisit. But yeah. I also have a question for you, Roland, which has to do with freedom and individual choice uh, presumably you think of yourself as being able to articulate uh, choice in that area only because uh, I'm not mad it helps. if I was mad I couldn't that's your own view <laughs> no no but it, but it yes, helps I, I, yes well, thank you <laughs> whoever said that <laughs> but I, I have yes but if yeah, I, if I, think, I think I have to take on board as I've just come into this meeting from a Zoom I wasn't expecting to attend on uh, salt, stone and steam, the history of coastal shipping up the River Mersey, which was all about um, the things we used to do as a manufacturing country in the 19th and early 20th century. Now it's all container ships and no, no coastal shipping. <laughs> I only sat in on that because of an accident of, but it taught me a thing or two about history. And, um, but I, 
I, I'm still curious. I, I like to think of myself and the Frankel reference, I think is very interesting and you know, in the middle of all of this as having some say over my destiny. And I speak as somebody who had to teach and read and do Thomas Hardy and many other writers of that kind where there's a constant battle between for free will and determinism going on in all those pages. But it's nice for us to, to feel that we have some influence over the, the movement of matters and affairs, and isn't it? And Sartre was part of that hippiedom that helped us think in those ways that we could make a difference. I don't think it was his well, fault that the 60s petered out into the 70s. Considerate. But there you are. But, so, so, so there's a question. So freedom, freedom matters, doesn't Shouldn't it? Shouldn't we consider all things um, and learn from them, whether we like them or not? I'm sorry, who? Shouldn't we consider all things um, yeah. and learn from them, um, whether we decide to absorb them or not? I think very often we're, we're caged by um, our things that restrict us and that everything is good to learn from. Yeah, mm, I agree. I agree, Sue. Um, but um, yeah, the, 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 the basic point, though, that you're making is that there are those restrictions. Um, we, we, yeah, and yet we struggle to be free. And we're, and we're struggling to be free. But I mean, yeah, I, I mean, don't think the, the two we points of view, the two points of view are, are, are we free? Are we free? I or, think we can personally be quiet about it and just reflect on what we believe, you know, or what we want to absorb from them. And, and not be too dogmatic about that, uh, and let our lives evolve as a result of um, our reactions and responsibilities. I, I think that the, the thing of being responsible is very important, and that's what he's talking about. Ooh, I'm sure it's, it's also fair to say that Sartre's plays are works of their time, 1943, yeah. 1944, yeah. Beckett's um, Waiting for Godot saw the light of day in 1949 in its original French edition, five yes. years on. It's interesting to compare the two and the change, change think, of mood. I think if Sue had met Sartre in in a cafe in Paris, I think you'd have gone very well. I think. No, not, 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 <laughs> not at all. She no. probably kicked him where it hurts. No, that's Can I come back, I come no. back to what um, to what Ed, Ed was saying about deconstruction, which I don't think we we um, we went into. But I mean, because uh, I'm 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 struggling with this. It was a, a France. Uh, I just I've been the kind of deconstruction <laughs> movement. Um, <laughs> But in what way, and what way are we deconstructed? I mean, what way, what way has that manifested itself? And how has that, how has that led to greater freedom and liberation? How, oh, has it been positive? Are you asking me, has it been a positive movement? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, what, in what way has it actually really taken place? Or is it just, it just being talked about? I mean, is it, is it just saying things like, oh yeah, we regret our colonial past, and wish we hadn't done that. Well, sorry. I think, sorry, or how would you like some of your art back that we stole from you? Is yeah. that the kind of thing we're talking about? I mean, no, we'll no, take a few statues down of a few slave traders. No, I'm talking about something that's far more structurally uh, concerned than just something uh, tangible like that. Okay. So, I mean, this, this could be a whole nother lecture in itself, uh, deconstruction, but um, before we get too far off the subject, I want to come back to a point that what I tried to do in the conversation was talk about how the, the, the discussion that Sartre is having in Les Mouches actually goes back to the origins of philosophy. And he's talking about things that have been debated at the very beginning before Plato even decided to take a stance, right? Mm -hmm. These are, these are, um, questions that go back to the very roots of what it means to be a person, right? What does it mean to be in life? Is it is existence versus, uh, is existence come first or essence come first, right? Mm -hmm. And this is really a fundamental question. And the way that Sartre comes down on it is that he says that we are born with no preconceptions as a tabula rasa and what we, we, we become what we do. If we choose not to act, then we become, I don't know, to take your example of uh, parking on the green, you know, we become a bad person if we start doing what, what you're doing, 
right? We are what we are what we do. And if you're doing bad things, like leaving your car in the middle of the road so other people can't park, then you essentially, this is what you are becoming. And I think that this is a very crucial point is to understand that he's in a line of philosophy that is tangling with these big questions. Yeah, he ripped it off from Heidegger uh, 100% in my mind. And so he's not that significant, but he is grappling with serious questions here. And it is the question of what is our ontology as a human being? Are we born you know, as a sinful person, as a selfish person? Or do we make choices that that is who we ultimately become? This is a very uh, fundamental question in, in, in philosophy. I said, Can I say something? Oh, I'm sorry, Eva, you wanted to say something. I just wanted to say that I, I wonder too whether um, he was, this was also a reaction perhaps about religion in, in the war years where people would blame God for this or God for that and why doesn't God do this and the other and mm -hmm. the reaction would be it's up to us and perhaps individuals and collectively for what is going on. It definitely, I mean, it definitely comes out in the play, right? There is the state and there is the, the gods and, and he yes. rejects both of them. No, I, yes. I absolutely agree with you. And did because you of his relationship with Zeus in the play, um, Orestes and, and Zeus. Yes. Does uh, anybody who hasn't said anything want to contribute some, uh, any comments? Um, I thought I saw somebody that wanted to, okay. So everybody satisfied? I, I mean, I wanted to, to follow up on something Michael has said, actually. Okay. Uh, Michael mentioned hippie women. And um, thing I was very aware of as, um, as a student in the, in the you know, uh, when I went to France to teach and I met all these teachers who had been students and, you know, had gone and done crazy things and come back to lead normal lives. I mentioned earlier that. I think your connection's bad again, Bruno. I don't know if you want to try to rejoin us later. <clears throat> yep, he's, uh, looks like he's frozen. Yeah, you're frozen in time, Bruno. Frozen in time. <laughs> like the statue of Zeus. At yeah, exactly. <laughs> But nevertheless, very powerful in that. Uh, <laughs> Fortunately, there's no blood smeared on his on his white <laughs> marble exactly. face. Exactly. Exactly. And he's definitely more powerful than Zeus. He doesn't rely on our remorse, does he, <laughs> or our prayers, or. <laughs> he wouldn't want to be known as the Lord of the Flies, anyway, right? <laughs> Beelzebub. He's back, I think. Are you back, Bruno? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Sorry about that. Um, yes, so on, on the subject of hippiedom, there was an exodus in the 60s and 70s of young French people to the Far East. And, um, and of course, they hadn't all read being a nothingness, but there is in Sartre's definition of, you know, what it is to be a human being, you know, in the being what you are not and not being what you are. There's this element of nothingness, of negativity. It's all about the negation of the ego. And uh, this degree, you know, huge. I think your ego has taken a turn for the word, Bruno. Sorry? We're we losing. Sorry, Ed? We didn't hear that, Bruno. We, didn't, we missed uh, that last part. He, you know, he, he had a huge influence on young people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, so. he, he, he was a celebrity, you know, philosopher, and, and, yeah. and people lived. They, they went out to the Far East. And they, you know, what's the, the big square in the Kathmandu where you, you, all you could hear was the doors and, you know, everyone was getting stoned. Yeah. You know, according to some, half the people there at any given time were French and the other half were German. Mm. Mm. Yeah, very much so. The spirit of 68. Well, it still lives on in France now. I mean, they still talk about 1960. Yes. Still, they, yes. I mean, that and the French Revolution are the two big driving factors on, on you know, a lot of people who are, you know, uh, what you might describe as thinkers in, in France. So, yeah, yeah, I think he's had a fantastic, um, uh, powerful influence. 
I mean, even though his writing is, is difficult to read. So we're having a few technical problems. Um, we're up, coming up close on the, to the, uh, close on the uh, hour. So we've got about 10 minutes left. Is there anybody who, who uh, uh, has, has anything that they want to, um, they want to throw in there? I think there's cool. Well, I think if, um, oh, is, is Mike Collins got his microphone on? Oh. No, oh, no, I said I, said I do have a, a funny little Lord of the Flies story I'd love to share. It only yeah. takes 10 seconds. Take us away. <laughs> well, when William Golding wrote the first draft, it, was, it started with a nuclear explosion, right? And then all the kids were on a desert island. And he went into his publisher and the terrifying editor who he works with said to him, turn it into a plane crash. So he did. And that's the Lord of the Flies as we know it. No nuclear disaster. <laughs> that's the power of editors for you. Potentially. <laughs> well, it's the influence, influence of other people, perhaps. There you go. And what for price freedom, huh? <laughs> there is no freedom. Ed, if we don't have any more contributions, maybe we should wrap this one up. Okay. It's been a good discussion. It's very stimulating. Um, I would like to thank Ed for a fantastic presentation and you all for a fantastic discussion. Really very good. Yes. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you everybody for, uh, for tuning in and um, I hope it, it was, as, as Mark said, it was uh, very enlightening to hear everybody's contributions. And uh, we will have the announcement coming out from the garden party should be coming out in the next uh, week. Probably it will come out next week. So uh, stay tuned for that. But uh, would, would you mind if I just made a suggestion, uh, Ed, if yeah. I may, just at the end, that the uh, society uses whatever substantial reserves it has to get you a slightly better line in theatrical props next time. <laughs> and maybe a, a curtain could come down and there could be some music and some theatrical interlude of some sort. I think we could probably just do a little bit better than that. All right. Uh, in terms of the props. Um, but, but maybe Katie can be put in charge of the of the theatrical budget. I was just... Well, I did use her Aeschylus uh, for, for Zeus, so... Uh... <laughs> it, it, wasn't, it wasn't quite godlike enough, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it gets better. Yeah. David, you should be on the stage. You really should. Have you ever been? You can't blame God. Who are you yeah, to? yeah well, I, I need Zeus to bring me on there. <laughs> <laughs> or bring you down. <laughs> well, here, here Hermes, I have Hermes here. He can bring him down. He's the victim of God after all. Okay, all right. well, thank you very much, Ed. That was... Uh, Thanks, Ed. Thanks for yeah, thank Ed. I look thank forward you very to much, Ed. Audition. I look forward to you auditioning at LBC. Mark, you, you'll, you'll take over from Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage, yes, exactly. Yes. Oh, ah, Piers Morgan. Oh. Cheers, guys. Everybody. All right, bye now. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, guys. Have a nice evening. Thank you.